All right, this is Chris from Brothers Speed Podcast. We've been discussing black LGBT issues and topics. And you know what? I have a special treat today, and I'm actually very happy because it's the first time I've actually had a comedian on the show, you know? So I definitely want to talk about this young man. He's actually been a very down to earth and very easy to talk to, but he's also been named one of the funniest LGBT comics by Out.com and BuzzFeed that's appeared on MTV, BET, Viceland, including OWN, again, Mother, Mother Oprah, I love him. Uh, he's appeared definitely on that and also he's done several projects which he's going to be talking about very soon in regards to his documentary A Tough Act to Follow his current album Shea Butter and Jesus which I, I love that title already and also when it comes to his book Carefree Black Boy I definitely want to talk about that will you please welcome Mr. Samson McCormick how you doing Samson? I am blessed. I'm doing so good, brother, and I'm so happy to be on here. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know what? I was thinking about the name Samson, and I've never said the word Samson. <laughs> I'm You've thinking, never I've never it? called anybody Samson before. This is <laughs> it's the first time. You know, didn't grow, up on, didn't grow up on black movies, you know, like, I want to call the Samson. I, I didn't grow up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, okay, I've, I've heard Samson before, but how come I've never actually had anybody in my circle or outside that I actually called him by the name? I thought that was funny. I, I, I had a realization on that because it does well, fall off the top. you're about to be saying it a whole lot now, so you better get <laughs> Well, I do appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you so much. You know, you know one of the things that the, really amazed me when I was kind of looking at your story was the fact that you've actually been in this business for seven years. 17 years 17 years long 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 that's a long time it is it's a long time and i mean it's i mean but looking at you know people who've been in it for 60 years i mean and and i never understood why people get lifetime achievement awards or why they go on and on and on about receiving those types of awards or the importance of of honoring people who've done the work and who persevered i understand it um, because 17 years, I mean, it's, um, I have a lot longer to go and I still consider myself a baby in this business, although, you know, I know a lot. And I, uh, Debbie Allen, uh, and also my, uh, or I would call, I should call her Miss Allen. She would pop me in my mouth if she heard me say that. <laughs> uh, and, and my theater teacher, Carol Foster, uh, you know, both they were telling me, you know, they were like, even though I've been doing theater since I was in middle school, uh, they say when, when you when you start a career and when you really get into it, you really don't strongly develop until you get about 15 or 20 years. So I'm really, really just understanding what I'm doing now ah, and, uh, okay. and the power behind it, why it's so important. Okay, like fine wine, basically. The fine wine, you get better. Absolutely. Right? All right. Absolutely. But you know what? What has that journey been like? That's that's my biggest thing, for especially being an out. First of all, let's go back a little bit further. As far as being out, was that something that you originally planned to just come out exactly no, that way? And, no, no. And sometimes, can I cuss? Of course you can. Okay, okay, good. Because I was about to say, oh, damn, I can't cut none of this plan. But uh, <laughs> it, it, sometimes I really, ask, I find myself sitting down sometimes asking, you know, what in the world were you thinking? <laughs> because <laughs> it, it I, to be uh, honest, Chris, it really has not made anything any easier. Um, and I often, and I'm not going to, I can't sit here and make it seem like it has been a cakewalk and, and I'm this fierce, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, black king who's, I am a fierce black king, but I can't make it seem like I'm just this fierce black king who's unbothered and unmoved um, because the truth is I've had to survive. And I mean, this is the thing is, people look at the glitz and glam of show business, but it's a lot of rejection. There are a lot of setbacks, and it takes a whole lot of determination. Um, it takes a lot of hard work, and it takes a lot of perseverance already as it is. Um, unless you're a white man, then you can be as mediocre as you want to be. But uh, we'll leave that alone. But <laughs> I think that, I think that. Uh, you know, with the challenges that already exist for us in this business and then to come right back out on top of that and go, well, I'm also same gender loving. I'm a, I'm a gay black man. Yeah. The level of ignorance, the, the, the rejection, um, some of the setbacks, some of the categories that I put in have definitely made it a lot harder. But I, I feel like a much deeper perspective that has allowed me to just be a better and stronger person overall, in addition to an effective artist. 
You know what? Especially considering the fact that, well, you know what? If I look at all the, the, the stereotypical ideas, if I really think that sometimes they really believe that maybe those who are out cannot relate to a straight audience. Is that the situation that you sometimes come across? Personally, no. Uh, but I will say that I've had people, you know, a lot of club bookers or, you know, different people who who could give me a hand. It's not like I'm up on stage talking about sucking dick. Yeah. Because I don't even talk about, like, I mean, I haven't even done that in about a year. So <laughs> <laughs> that's number one. <laughs> and then number two is, uh, I mean, I, I feel like I have a responsibility to represent us in a way that is authentic to myself. Sex is not the only thing that I'm thinking about. When I'm out in the world, the first thing that I experience life as is a black man. And well, first is a human being, and then second, a very close second is a black man. Yeah. And then third, I'm also a gay man. Um, and I mean, and those are different intersections that I shape my work around. But people are so caught up in labels. And so the thing that I challenge myself to do is is to show up with those different perspectives as a human being, as as a black man, as a as a man who is LGBT through all those different ways, and in in one way or another, if we really sit down together, no matter who we are, we experience life in the same capacity one way or another. Right. So that allows me to connect with people in ways people don't expect for us to, and I do. And it's it's a very beautiful thing. I mean, I, you would think, for me, doing this, uh, to be in places like Mississippi, I go to Mississippi, I go to Iowa, I go to Alabama, I go to Florida. Um, you know, in the deep, deep Bible Belt, and I get standing ovations. So wow. I think that that speaks for itself. Right, and it does speak towards the growth that you definitely see, especially in the Bible Belt areas. Well, the thing is, I think really is just really helping people to relate to you as a human being, and if people, and I mean, and I don't have a problem with somebody disagreeing with me. Yeah. You know, you don't have to agree with LGBT. You don't have to care about me being black or whatever. Or, or any of those things, I simply ask that you respect me as an individual, um, and I will respect you. And I think we establish that whenever I'm on stage. And I think that again comes down to relatability. Like I see where you're coming from. Yeah, I did a show in Traverse City, Michigan, and you can Google this story. Um, and the Ku Klux Klan came out to the show. Whoa! And that could have gotten ugly. Like I mean, because I remember when they when they came to me in the green room. And because, you know, it's, you know, you know how it is, yeah. um, you know, when you go to a, a small Bible Belt town or someplace where it's not a lot of black people, you know, black people, you know, we play this game called count the black people. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and it was some bullshit because it was only one black person oh in that my whole God. town that I saw. <laughs> and that was the one who picked me up from the airport. <laughs> Man, okay, feel kind of lonely. I see. All right, <laughs> it was very, and, I, and I wanted to, I wanted to bring her back with me. You know, I was because she, cause, you know, she. That's why she booked me for the show. She was like, "Cause it's that bad." She said, "You got to fly black people in." <laughs> so wow. it was, it was, it was, it was really something else. And so she told me, and and I can, you know, send you the picture. They sent about ten people to pick me up from the airport. Wow. And uh, and it was it was that serious. So they said, yeah, but we just wanted to make sure you were safe. And I didn't know what that meant. I mean, I like I'm uh, I make a living with words, so I could tell by the way that they phrased it yeah. that it meant something. <laughs> uh, but it wasn't until like uh, that morning, the next morning, you know, um, we were doing radio, and so uh, some sort of way it slipped out at the radio station that the Ku Klux Klan and some church groups. And they just so happen to be affiliated because, you know, the Ku Klux Klan, they claim to be a Christian group. Uh, Interesting. Uh -huh. um, and so I kind of ignored it. I was like, well, that's crazy, but whatever. And I got to the show up and security, she comes back to me. One of the security guards comes back to me in the green room and she goes, hey, so you got protesting. And, you know, that's nothing new to me because, like I said, I've been out in the LGBT and comedy before that even became a thing. Yeah. And so, you know, when I was doing shows before gay marriage was recognized legally and all those things. So when she said, 
you got protesters. I was like, oh, that's fine. Let them in. And <laughs> she said, well, these are a different kind of protests. And I was like, well, who are they? And she was like, it's the Klan. And so I'm caught off guard. I'm like, you mean like the Wu-Tang Klan? Like, oh. what type of Klan are you talking about? <laughs> you know, because I only know two of the motherfuckers. And she said the Ku Klux Klan. And, um, and I was too through. Now, I will tell you, I was insulted because you know they don't dress up. Them. They, they didn't dress up? They don't dress up in their robes anymore. They show up looking like they work at the Apple store or some shit like that. Because, you know, they show up with um, <laughs> with with polo shirts and khakis and things yeah. like that on. Yeah. But, I mean, but these were rednecks that came to the show. They were angry. They had a Confederate flag, and they were in there. It, was, it could have been a riot easily. I went up there. The first thing I said was, my thing is this. I, You and I, number one, is black men in this country first. And and then number two is black LGBT men. Right. We've always in some capacity been the pink elephant in the room, in of our course. church, in our family, in our cities, in our communities. And we've had to find a way to address that. So I don't run away from the pink. Uh, we've been whatever color elephants we were. We've been rainbow. We've been <laughs> St. Copa color. We've been whatever, you know. Whatever type of elephant it is that needs to be addressed, I address that elephant. And this elephant in the room was a Confederate colored elephant, so I address that motherfucker. I'm like, look, y'all. So we got the clan up in this motherfucker. Let's welcome them to the show. Wow. And the audience is looking at me like, you must be on some good shit. <laughs> and I'm like, let's welcome them to the show. And I was like, because my thing is, is we all deserve love. And my thing is, I know what it's like to be first a black man in this country. And I know what it's like to be a black gay man in this country. So that's allowed me to be able to give somebody else compassion when they don't deserve it. Right, right. Because that's I understand where they're coming from. I understand that very dangerous, angry, and I don't want to say dark because, you know, we, we made dark uh, a negative thing. Uh, but it's a very low place that they're in. Mm -hmm. and, and I was like, and we cannot meet them on that place where they're in and expect for anything to change. So I was like, welcome to the show. I was like, thank you for coming. And the lady stood up in there. And this is the second time Merlin at, at a bar, uh, a woman stood, or no, it was a dude, actually, stood up in the back of the theater and he called me a nigger. Uh, and that was back in 2006. Whenever Don Imus talked about nappy-headed hoes, I had a joke about that. And, wow. um, you know, when the lady stood up in the theater and called me a nigger, like niggers. And I said, well, that's fine. I got a couple of niggas I hate too, so we got something in common. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you were good. That was good. I got to tell you. Because a lot of people don't, well, wouldn't know exactly how to face that. And basically, so you've been around a little bit long enough to actually know how to even how to handle that. Uh, you know, that's the thing. You know, and, and Martin Luther King, he said it beautifully. He said, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. And um, and I mean, it's just you can't respond to ignorance with ignorance, you know, so I just responded. And I mean, and that's the thing. And that's the beautiful thing about humor is we've always as black people, particularly I think black people and Jewish people have used humor to survive. And um, and I mean, I, I think that that was just a uh, it was just very second nature for me to respond like that, because when I said that the audience was shocked for a second. But they gave me an applause break. Yeah, yeah. And That's I good. saw her face and she sat down. Because you could see in her face, like, she was like, ma'am, she was like, that nigga's good. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't give and, her what uh, she wanted, basically. Yeah, you know, and so she sat down and I tell you this, and you can, and you can ask anybody who was there, I will give you their emails. You can call the, the ticket office. You can call Planned Parenthood Traverse City and they will tell you this, what I'm telling you right now. As a matter of fact, you can go back through my Instagram stories uh, or, or uh, pictures and the story is up. It's, it's on there somewhere. Wow. Uh, wow. From when I was there and I wrote about it. This happening, this story that I'm telling you now. But I continue with the show and, um, and they actually laughed at some of the things that I was up there talking about. The KKK? And in the back of my head, I'm thinking, I'm like, well, this proves that we all have a lot more in common than we have, you know, not in common. Right. And right. Uh, and at the end of that show, everybody in that theater stood up and clapped for me, including those racists who were sitting in the back of that theater. Wow. I can be honest with you. That that takes a lot. That, that takes a lot of talent, but also 
to think at the spur of the moment because a lot of people just don't have that. And I know I wouldn't know exactly what what type of behavior I would have actually you know, have said a comment like that was actually said in the middle of everything. But you, let me ask you this. When were you actually pulled into comedy? What made you say, this is the route that I'm going to go? <laughs> Sometimes I'm still like, what on earth? That's another thing. Not only are you gay, but bitch, you had in there to do comedy too. Exactly. Um, <laughs> I still, I really don't know. I mean, I will tell you this, Chris, is that I have always loved theater. I've always loved humor. Um, I grew up on humor. I grew up on Red Fox. I grew up on Joan Rivers. I grew up on Whoopi Goldberg. I grew up on Arsenio Hall. And I grew up through that period of the 90s where black humor was one of the most effective political tools that we had, you know? So when we needed to find a way to laugh and have conversations, because if you go back and Google some of the old stories, shows like In Living Color provoked a lot of important conversations around racial issues that involved things like Rodney King and the LA, uh, the LA riots and you know and 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 all these different issues that affected the black community right you know if you go back and look at arsenio like arsenio and and i and i love arsenio hall um and i'm lucky you know that he knows who i am and that every now and then we get to talk um because he's somebody who i grew up on you know and um if you go back and look at some of the topics of his shows and some of the guests and the humor that was infused in a lot of really important conversations. And even if you go back further and you look at shows like uh, uh, Good Times and The Jeffersons, mm-hmm. you know, and what's happening, like they covered things that we were going through and they used humor to allow us to talk about them. So I grew up on all those things and I grew up in a period of time, you know, late 80s, early 90s when You know, and it was a much less sensitive period than it is now where we could play the dozens, right? And I'm going to get to the question that you asked me in a second, answering it. But I just wanted to give you a full backstory so you can understand exactly where I'm coming from. Sure. Um, And and, and we had, and I can't, and I'm, I'm so upset at myself that I didn't say this first. We had Deaf Comedy Jam. True. You know, and I grew up on all of those things. And on our playgrounds and in our front yards and, and, and on the school bus and walking home and in the cafeteria and in the classroom, we played the deserts, you know. So uh, and a lot of us and I, and I mean, I'm, I'm from D.C., you know, so in our neighborhoods and I grew up in Maryland, I grew up in Maryland, D.C., North Carolina. I grew up in, you know, in those areas and, and we didn't have two of anything to rub together. Right. Right. And playing the dozens allowed us to to laugh at not knowing who our daddy was or being, (laughs) you know, three or four siblings and having three or four different daddies. Yeah. Or having roaches or not being educated or we were able to laugh at that. So, I mean, that was already instilled in me at a very young age to use humor to take life so seriously that I grew up in the theater. Um, when I was in elementary school, I was trying to sing opera. My mother was not having it. So she said, you can do anything else in the theater, but don't sing opera. Wow. So, wow. Why, why was she so afraid of opera? Well, I mean, the, the masculinity thing. It's little boys don't. And I was a soprano when I was young. So I could sing soprano. And she was like, oh, no, baby. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Okay. Funny how we, we use that. We, we prevent. Cause next thing you know, she didn't. If she would have prov- kind of encouraged you, you could have been the next black opera singer. <laughs> you you never know. But I mean, I loved it and I loved singing because I didn't want to be a comic. I wanted to be a singer. Yeah. Oh. Um, and okay. so it was. It was my theater teacher. Uh, it was one of my teachers in school, who looking at me cut up in class. She would always say, "I see you sing and." Whenever you talk about the song that you're going to sing or this or that, people look, they listen to you sing, but they're connected when you're talking about what you sing because okay. it's funny, it's engaging. And, um, and she was like, and you really need to look into that. And I always uh, nailed all the comedic roles in, in acting and theater. And, um, and then it was her and my English teacher who threatened me in high school. They said, if you don't go get on stage and do comedy, we will fail you. <laughs> 
<laughs> so it was coercion, in other words. <laughs> and, 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 and once I got in there in the in the in the early two thousand, it was a bit of a decline in some elements of black comedy and mainstream. Okay. I mean, Death Comedy Jam still came on, but we didn't have Arsenio Martin. There were only a few Martin reruns. Like it, it wasn't what it was when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't looking at it so much. But once I went back. And I, that was actually my first time in a comedy club. Uh, when I when I got in there, back to everything that I had grown up with, and and what I loved about looking at it when I was growing up, and I felt home. And oh, wow. uh, and actually, the first night that I did anything on on a comedy stage, which was Teddy's House of Comedy in D.C., which is now closed, oh, wow. um, but it was a Def Jam comedy club, and they didn't give a damn that I was 15 years old. Um, they they were like, well, bitch, if you ain't funny, we're gonna boo your little young ass. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I mean, and I'm and 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 the first show that I did was awful, and I'm glad that it was because if I would have gone in there and nailed it the first time, I don't know if I would still be doing it. Wow, wow! At 15, that's a that takes a lot of guts to to, to want to do well, that at that particular time. Now, well, yeah, and and I mean, and I wasn't old enough to get into the club, so. They had to um, they had to sneak me in the back door and um, and I had to give them my lunch money. I had to get a bounce because I would go every Wednesday because that's all I that was the only club I knew and the internet wasn't what it is now. So you could like look up and see what was going on. So I mean that was the only club. I think I had called four one one or something and um, they said yeah information or whatever or whatever they called. You know, but we call them information, and you say, "Well, hey, you know, I'm looking for a comedy club in DC. Can you tell for comedy on I Street?" I said, "Can you give me the number?" So I got the number, got the address, and the lady was at the desk. Her name was Kenyatta, and um, she knew I was young, but I walked up in there, based on my voice and everything, like, "Yeah, you know, I'm, 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 I want to be a comedian." <laughs> she said, "Really?" I said, "Yeah." And um, she said, well, how old are you? I said, oh, um, and I slipped up because I was just, this is Dilly. I said, uh, 15. And she said, I'm going to ask you this one more time. And this is going to determine whether or not you get into this club tomorrow night. I said, okay. She said, how old are you? I said, oh, 18. <laughs> Me, whatever the bouncer's name is at the back door, they bring $10 and he'll let you in. And, um, and she was like, and of course you can't drink. But, uh, and at first, you know, for the first few weeks, I had to like pay them, get me in or whatever. And, uh, and then I started having good sets. So they started letting me come in the front door and I didn't have to pay. And he was telling me, he was like, man, that shit you said the night was so funny. And he was like, well, what was wrong with you the first night you came? You was funny. And, you know, and we talked and, um, and I'm really happy that I started when I did. I mean, initially, I thought it was going to be this big ego stroke because I don't go around bragging about abilities or talents. But I've always been able to do is I know how to I know how to interact with people and I can make people laugh and not even just on a because, I mean, people don't understand like there's a you can be funny in person, but not be funny on stage. True. That's very true. But. But it wasn't until I really started getting into the theater and, I, and you know, I was writing these crazy stories and whenever I had class presentations, I would write it and it would be funny. And they told me to go. And I kind of approached it from a uh, uh, ego. But I will definitely tell you, it has been the most humbling, uh, the most spiritually grounding mentally challenging <laughs> and um, and as frustrating as it can be sometimes I'm so happy that I'm doing it you know I mean definitely just to be going out there at that age of 15 going to clubs doing your thing now you kind of work your way up and work your way up to where you are now what, what are the differences you've seen in comedy well uh, I definitely would say and even though there's still a lot of comedy is a very male dominated business and when I say male I don't just mean straight white men macho straight black men uh, it's a very so I mean if you're anything else even if you're a white woman if you're a black woman if you're LGBT if you're disabled which there aren't many disabled comics who've gotten shine um, 
you have certain challenges. And I mean, my thing is I was in the black clubs initially because I didn't know you could make white people laugh. I didn't know until I really started studying the history of old Moms Mabley albums, of old Red Fox albums, of Richard Pryor, that that white people really relate to black humor. And and they had our records. And you know, and then when I was going to the clubs and I was doing these late night shows, they would be white people would be sneaking in the back door to hear our shit. Wow. And you know, and they and they would tell you to they said, I, I want you to be you know, they would come up to you like they would order a food or some shit like that. You know, they'd be like, I want you to do it really dirty tonight. Can you do it really dirty? Like a dirty <laughs> shit you come up with. Yeah, they were crazy. And um, and I didn't think that, that I could make white people laugh until until I saw them sneaking out. And then they closed Teddy's House of Comedy, uh, which was a black club. And then at Tacoma Station, which was another club in D.C., um, they would beat your ass. They would physically beat your ass if you weren't funny. <laughs> wow. So a good and thing I remember you one that. night Chris Tucker came in there after rush hour and got booed off the stage. <laughs> Wow. So, so that tells you how rough they were. So, so being being then uh, an out gay, you know, stand up, and and mind you, you already know how black black people are. Some black people are about sexuality and things like that. Um, so to have that on top of an audience is like, bitch, I came here to a comedy club not to laugh. Right. Right. <laughs> because not only was I a new comic. But I was I was dealing with a lot of taboo issues, my sexuality being one of them. Uh, which the first couple, I'm not gonna lie, the first couple of years I was doing pussy jokes, I mean, you know, pussy and child support jokes, because I thought that's what, you know, I thought, oh, that's what you gotta do. And um, and then the more detail that I got in that, you know, how you know, pussy and this and that, the audience would be looking at me like, oh, that don't sound like a pussy you're describing to me. So. <laughs> <laughs> that so, got exposure right there, right? <laughs> yeah, so so it was that. Um I just got tired of running into that every time I got on stage and, and it was also uh coming out because I mean I've always known that I, I always have known that I'm gay. But to actually say it to the world let alone to your mother or to your church or to your siblings or father or whoever is something completely different. And so when I would be at these clubs, you know, it was that was just something that just was not going on. Now, if you look at comedy, comedy is a little bit more diverse. Um, you see a few more, even though it's still not many, you know, and definitely not enough getting mainstream attention. You see LGBT comics, you see more lesbian comedians. Uh, you know, you see diversity showcases, which back then they weren't having, you know, like now they have CBS diversity showcase. They have this and that diversity showcase. Comedy Central will say, okay, well, we want at least two women on the show. Yeah. Whereas back then they didn't have that. Like back then they had nigger night, <laughs> you know, Tuesday at a club uh, where they had specials on Hennessy um, and, and Hennessy and chicken wings. <laughs> and that's the only night that they will let you perform. And then, I mean, comedy was it was underground, and it was in it was in gay clubs that weren't, um, you know. And I mean, unless you venture out into the gay world, you don't know that stuff exists, you right. know. And I had trained myself to look at anything, any obstacle, anything that you would look at as a limitation. I trained myself to look at it as as an opportunity. And I really pushed the envelope on that. So, I mean, so that is one thing that's changed. Another thing that has changed is the Internet has a lot more people thinking they're funny. Like, everybody's a comedian now. So oh, there my is, God. Which I, I believe that that's fade out. I'm praying that it does. You think um, so? You really think so? It, it better. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because I see it all the time. It's, I'm on Instagram. You always see somebody. These people are moving to L.A., based upon these videos now don't get me wrong some people have done extremely well um some mm -hmm. people have done very well with these videos and they will fight till the end of time to make sure that does not stop <laughs> but yeah. it's, it's amazing well, we that what happened to them bitches that was on vine didn't you the, oh, oh you know vine shut down so a lot of those people it's like bye 
The, you know what? You're right. You're right. Well, see, they move over to Instagram, didn't they? <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> you know, some of them did, but I mean, the thing is, it wasn't the same. Like, like if they were on Vine and they had, oh my lord, if they if they were on Vine and they had uh, a million followers and they tried to go to Instagram, like a lot of people, they were just somebody else that people were following. It's like they didn't make anything that set them aside because it's only so many people can put wigs on. True. That's true. You know, there are only so many people who can eat cinnamon and fall down the steps and do this and do that. And um, and 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 I mean, a part of me was very angry about that at one time. I was like, you know, why are these people getting so much attention? Like, why do why do people think that this is something new or groundbreaking? I think it's dumb. And I actually ran into a couple of those uh, Instagram folks. And I don't know, like, I mean, in order to, because I mean, you got to change with the time. Now, will I be on Instagram putting on wigs? No, I will not. <laughs> but uh, I have also learned to um, respect it as as what it is. It is what it is. And um, and I ran into Quay and and Lala, and um, and they were doing their thing. And I've I've always and especially if you're black and you're trying to do something, I'm going to support you. Um, and you know they're doing their thing, and I've I've respected it for what it is. There's a difference between doing a video and a crowd. There's a difference between if somebody's laying in their bed bored at eleven o'clock at night looking for stupid stuff to exactly. keep their attention, and actually having people pay fifteen or twenty or between twelve and standard for a club is twelve and twenty five dollars to pay to come in and look at you for forty five minutes. And the thing is, is they get booked, but they don't have 45 minutes of material to stand up on stage and do. That's true. That's true. You're right about that. And it's, and I don't know. I mean, it's, and this is not me looking down at anybody or, or anything like that. But I mean, I take a certain pride in knowing that I go on the road with the set of 40 minutes of material and I'm ready to record it. You know, every six months I can turn over a new 45 minutes if I'm on the road consistently. And there's a certain pride that I have in being able to do that. Right. You know, because it takes a certain level of discipline to do that and, and dedication. True. Whereas if you are creating videos or while your mama's at work or you don't have to work or you don't have to hustle to do any of those types of things, you get a million followers and you know, a million views and, and you get booked at clubs, but you show up and you don't have a show. To so know that when people pay fifteen, twenty dollars to see me, they're gonna get a show. That's true. There's just a certain pride that I have in that. Also have a lot more material to give than the average comedian. You have written your current album here, uh, which is actually your fifth album called <laughs> Shea Butter album. and Jesus. <laughs> Okay. Yes. <laughs> I, I mean, okay. First off, you got to tell me how you came up with this title, please. Marijuana. That, that's a good reason yeah. right there. I can see. Weed. It. I can see it. Weed. I was sitting up in there, and uh, <laughs> he was smoking. She was a 60, 67 year old white lady. Wow. And she said, "What keeps the black people so young?" And I told her, "Shea butter." And, juice. <laughs> and I kept the name. <laughs> Shea butter and Jesus. So, so what are people going to expect on those albums? On this album? Uh, well, you know, some experiences that I have in life. Now, if you want to talk about a reason for something that I recorded, you want to go back to an album I did about ten years ago called uh, "Don't Make Me Take Off My Earrings." <laughs> um, yeah, I did, and that was that was the first time that I had really, 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 really worked hard at developing a show, a solo show. It was about coming out. It took me about three years to really get to the point where I was ready to do that because I was still breaking out in sweats on stage when I was telling an audience that I was a gay man. Whoa, wait a minute. So, okay. So when you were actually going out at 15, did you already say at that age that you were gay? No. Back then I was doing child support jokes. <laughs> so I was doing child support, weed, pussy, and um and it wasn't until I was about 18 that I really, that's when I was, it was just, I don't know, there, was, there seemed to have been a black gay renaissance that started happening. There was gay hip hop, so you had people like Tim and West. I had never heard a gay a gay rapper before. You saw other people do it, you kind of felt a little bit more, more capable yeah. of doing it. 
Yeah, you know, and I was, and the thing is, is I was, I would go do shows at uh, at this place called Soho Cafe in Dupont Circle. So it was in D.C. and it was right across the street from the fireplace, which I hung out in the fireplace. It was a gay bar in D.C. and I would hang out at the bar. So when I, whenever I would uh, be sitting in there, get sit with my back turned to the window and my hood over my head, so that nobody would see me and come in there and um, and you know and say anything to me in front of the people. Because I was really scared. Gotcha. And I just got tired of that. It, you know, and I had this old joke where I used to talk about my barber. Because, you know, like I would I would go into my barber and uh, he would be like, you know, they talk to you about women. You know, man, so you dating, you know, whatever. And um, and I, I wasn't able to say that I was gay, but I could I could describe what it was that I liked. Right. And so, you know, he'd be sitting there and be like, oh, yeah, well, it sounds like you like your lady's kind of masculine. You know, <laughs> <laughs> wow! Dude, just totally missed it. Just totally missed it. I like I'm, you know, I like I'm kind of strong. I like for him to hold me at night while I'm asleep. I like to have a little bit of this light face. You're like, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> wow! So, uh, wow! But anyway, to get back to what you asked me, <laughs> was I just got tired of of alluding to things on stage and, and it felt weird when I changed the pronoun about somebody that I had a crush on or had went on a date with or whatever. And uh, and I got tired of hiding. It's like I would and then I was coming out like got kicked out of church and, and I needed somewhere to vent. And so I started getting up on stage. I remember one night I was at a club in Maryland and this went up before me and got up on stage and his neighbors were uh were gay. And he said that they were going to give him AIDS through the wall. Oh, wow. So it was, it, it was, I remember specifically, it was that night that I said, because it, it, at first, before that, it was like I would get on stage and talk about it sometime. Because mind you, I was still young, you know, and the thing is, is very rarely do we as young gay black men have somebody to sit us down and go, well, this is what your sexuality looks like. We only learn about it as nasty or something that we need to be ashamed of. So right. if it's something that you should be ashamed of, of course you're going to hide it. Right. And and I wasn't always comfortable talking about it every night. But when I did have the courage to talk about it, I would be covered in sweat. Wow. And wow. and I was never self-deprecating. But I remember I had this old joke where I would say, uh, I would be like, I don't understand why we don't, why people don't like gay people because we do all the same things. You know, gay people do all the same things, you know. Some of us play basketball, work on cars, beat up gay people. And even though it wasn't like self-deprecating, it was still like, it's not something I don't think I would do that now. Right. right. You know, but it's that was, those were the times and that's how I had to handle it. And I will tell you this too, Chris, before shows, because a lot of the shows, because I mean, I'm from D.C. D.C. is where I really developed the chops at. Like, I was still doing New York and Boston and New Jersey and things like that. But D.C. is where I was really developing those chops at. Okay. And and I would be sitting uh, in Georgetown at this place called Mr. Smith's. It was a, They used to have a show every Tuesday I would do. Okay. And uh, I would be sitting at the Georgetown Canal, and that's about 400 feet up above the the, uh, the Potomac River, mm-hmm. uh, which is connected to the Atlantic Ocean, and I would be up there, and it took everything. It definitely was the hand of God that kept me from jumping off that cliff. It was a cliff that I would be sitting on, and um, I remember, like before those shows, I would just be sitting there crying, hot, and those tears would be hot, like they would be coming down my face. I was, I hated myself so much, and. Um, I said, well, I have to do something about this. So I started writing the things that I hated about myself. And sometimes it was the fact that I was black. Sometimes it was the fact that I came from a family that didn't have anything. Sometimes it was, well, most times it was me being gay and I felt nasty and I felt lonely and I felt disgusting and um, hated my nose. I hated my eyes. I hated the way that I talked. And I would write all those things down on this piece of paper and I would throw it off of the cliff. Um, and I think that that saved my life, and of course, I think comedy did too. So it was it was a combination of things. 
You know, it, cause now that makes sense because I did get your quote, you know, when you actually did your, your, your documentary, when you did say doing comedy actually saved my life. So now that I, I actually get it, it makes total sense with that story. And well, first off, what's the process of making your own, own album? How was that process in itself to say, I'm going to put this out there for people to actually really hear me? Okay, so the first albums were, uh, I mean, like I told you, I grew up on comedy, so I grew up on you know, Bill Cosby cassette tapes. It was mostly Bill Cosby cassette tapes. Oh, gotcha. I loved, uh, I loved George Carlin. I grew up on his HBO comedy specials. Um, and I thought he was very um, provocative because I had never seen anybody. And I mean, George Carlin was a known atheist and I had never seen anybody stand up on stage and so boldly and fearlessly go i don't believe in god and i was like whoa was like, oh my god but i love carlin carlin is actually one of my favorite comics and okay. um i mean and i believe in god but i had never seen anybody stand up on stage and do that and uh and that let me know that you could you could be provocative i always knew that i wanted to record a comedy album i started out with uh by going to the studios and there was a studio in merlin and i would go to and I would uh, I would record in the studio, like so. I would write jokes, and I would record in the studio. And the dude had some um, canned laughter, and he would put, he would put canned laughter over the over the jokes that I told. Him. And uh, and that's how I did my first ones. Cause I was in I was in high school, and I really didn't understand comedy like that. Right. But some of the stuff was funny. It was funny, like for a little boy that had written it. But um, it was it was different than perfecting material and then creating an event and having people to come in for a live comedy recording. Gotcha. Um, and I actually, when I did Don't Make Me Take All My Earrings, that became a, a, an album by accident uh, <laughs> because we recorded the the, uh, the audio for it, the, uh, the video for it. Yeah. And um, we were looking at the video. So much of that show came off the top of my head too that I said, well, I want to do something. So some of it became YouTube videos uh, I did some YouTube. If you go back, I think it's someone there from, from about seven or eight years ago when I finally put them on. Uh, where I'm talking about coming out gay to a to a black family, and I'm talking about being gay in the black church. Those things are off the top of my head. Oh wow! And wow. Uh, you know, talking about those, that's why I'm look. I look back at them now, and I mean, for the time I thought they were great, but looking back at them now, I'm like, damn, because you know, I was stuttering a little bit. I was. <laughs> saying uh like and 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 like because this stuff was coming up off the top of my head yeah. and i had never really stood up on a stage for an hour talking about being black and being gay and this and that and it was nerve-wracking so i said well i want to do something with this that you do off the top of my off the top of your head you just can't when I mean, you're performing you're, you're not going to do that again right you just not um so I said, well, what can we do? And I said, I tell you what, can we take the audio off? So we took the audio off and we cut we cut the uh, album up and we took the pieces that we wanted to put on an album. And by the time we got done, I think it became an album. Wow. 34, this is 34 minutes that came on top of your head. Off the top of my head. And then the other 30 minutes of the show, I kept and I didn't release that because I was still using that on the road. Wow. Wow, this is like, this is pretty interesting. So now you get to the point you say, you know what? I got an album under my belt. Now I want to write a book. Where, where did that come from? I did the first book that I wrote was Taboo Village. Okay, um, a perspective on being gay in Black America. And I wrote that book by accident because I started. I was writing material. I was going through a really bad breakup. Um, I was twenty one, twenty two, gotcha. and uh, I wrote that book because my the the guy that I was dating at the time. I had never had like a full out sexual relationship with a guy. The sex was great. Well, I thought it was because I was young and I had I hadn't had much of it yet. But looking back, <laughs> yeah, he was like, but. Um, <laughs> But I mean, for what it was, I mean, I was whatever Matthias was going, Matthias by it all. You know, they call it Dick, dick Matthias, Ass Matthias. Oh, man. You know, I was all Matthias. And, um, <laughs> and I didn't realize how toxic that relationship was. Like, boyfriend, he was a Gemini for one. And Gemini men, they crazy as hell. And, uh, 
<laughs> I got this old joke where I used to say I used to date this guy who I thought um what what oh I had this old joke I wrote about him where I said uh I said I used to date this guy who was bipolar, bipolar schizophrenic, but I didn't I didn't know he wasn't taking his meds as he thought he was a Gemini. And uh <laughs> so not only not only was this dude a Gemini, but he was bipolar and he had multiple personality disorder. Like boyfriend was seriously he was crazy as cat shit. And um wow. and he physically would attack me and we were both and he was homeless. Uh and so, you know, here I am at twenty two years old, twenty I think I was 21, uh, you know, taking care of another 21 year old, working two jobs. Um, he's physically abusing me. He's mentally and emotionally abusing me. And um, and we're fighting every night. And then after we get finished fighting, we go ahead and say, wow. And, and he's cheating, which I mean, I have views on stuff like that. I mean, a man is going to be a man. But I mean, he's, he's straight up running the streets. Um, and, and I, stayed with him for some reason i don't know what my problem was um but ultimately what he had the nerve to do he had the nerve to go become saved he said oh yeah i I got the holy ghost now and this and that and um so what he would do is is he would he would sit on the side of our bed and he would preach sermons to me out of the book out of the bible and um you know he would go right to leviticus he would go to corinthians he would go to this book and that book you know all the books that are said to damn gay people which they don't you know if you the interpretation we'll get back to that later right but anyway the long story short was we had we had him coming in every night oh god don't want us to do this and that and then he would put the bible down and we had sex and then he would get back up and start praying and carrying on and wow. um and it really like i mean i grew up in a church that 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 preached you know don't be gay right you know they preached that you would go to hell if you were gay they were preached that you know gay was a demon and uh gay people were child molesters and and they had aids and all these horrible things right right. but i had never really confronted that (laughs) spiritual element of it that psychologically and and mind you i had gotten kicked out of a church when i was young for being gay but i didn't care you know like all right whatever they just i didn't understand it i didn't understand the extent of the damage that that can really do to somebody if you throw the book at them and if you beat into their head that something is wrong with how they love and so it's that part and then it's that other part which says oh and you're going to hell so not only are you flawed now and and this is what's going to happen to you no matter what good you do in your life because God made you this way. Right, right, right. You know, so I had to deal with all those different things. And I was break up. I was having really bad anxiety attacks. You know, 21, 22 years old, I thought I was having a heart attack. Wow. I couldn't sleep at night because I thought if I went to sleep, I would die. And I didn't know that that was anxiety. I literally thought that I was dying. Like, I was like, wow. I'm dying. Wow. And of course, I was afraid of that because I was afraid, well, if I die, I'm going to hell. Yeah. yeah. So I had really, really bad anxiety. And um, <laughs> and I had to get that out. I had to process it. I had to deal with it. And um, and that was the only way that I was able to move forward, was write about it, get it out. And um, and that's how I wrote Taboo Village. Um, Taboo Village really went in depth into my experiences with religion um, and self-image issues and and really coming to terms with my sexuality and and experiences that I had growing up in the closet. And it was, I think it was one of my most heart, heartfelt, most heartfelt projects that I've ever done. And people related to it. And that book ended up in the library at Harvard University. Wow. Hey, I, you know what? I got a little interesting question about that too and getting to Harvard. So we'll, we'll touch on that too. So basically you have this, all this experience all jumbled up in this particular album and you continue to do more albums after that and so basically mm-hmm. leading up to where we are now the carefree black boy essays on life and redefining masculinity now what made you write this particular book um well it's all been a process and i, I should tell you too so before i did carefree black boy i did this book called um ebonic faggotry and, I did see that. Uh, yeah, so I did this book called Ebonic Bangetry, and it was really 
every every book i mean obviously i've been at different points and places in my life but i did that for us to to have conversations around sexuality and, and identity and 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 accepting and understanding each other and then i did um carefree black boy i kind of that was another labor of love okay. i did that because i think a lot of us had gotten really comfortable you know Back in the day, you couldn't just walk down the street with your man and hold hands. Now you see boys on the internet twerking and this and that. That wouldn't have been happening 10 years ago. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Absolutely it's brand new. Um, you know, and and it's even certain things that boys did back then that was suspect that got you looked at sideways like, um, like uh, uh, you know, we used to wear contacts. <laughs> it's kind of funny because yeah. the Jerry Carroll's never considered to be a gay thing. <laughs> that Jerry Carroll, that Jerry Carroll was gay as out of <laughs> it, it never seemed to be that the Jerry Carroll never made people let the man look gay. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that Jerry Carroll was just as gay as the monkey Jimmy. <laughs> wrote that book, and it took me a while, but I wrote it because. Um, still have a lot of conversations with people who are afraid to come out of the closet, who can't come out of the closet. Yeah. Um, I've even met people who are transitioning and they're transitioning, but they're afraid their parents will throw them out or will stop paying for their tuition or whatever. And um, some of the things are just from conversations that I was having with people. Um, me using my art as a tool to help liberate myself even further and liberate other people to a point where I was embracing freedom and using art as freedom and being free in my identity. Gotcha. And and I should note too that my very dear friend who I love so much, he's such a blessing. Uh, Daryl Stevens from Noah's Art uh, wrote the the uh, the introduction to that book, and it oh, was wow. outstanding. Yeah, it's kind of funny because I, I, I actually saw him recently over in the Wilt Manors area, and I, I'm like, yeah, he was down in Florida not too long ago. Yeah, yeah, and, and the, part of me was like, should I ask him to? Nah, never mind. He absolutely would have loved that. I'm sure. Yeah, because and you know sometimes when you're out, you know, I'm pretty sure you you know you understand that when when people are out, you don't always want to disturb them in their in their natural you know in their natural nope, peaceful nope, nope. time. I don't understand that. They'd be like, can I eat dinner with you? I have been out on dates. Let me tell you, I have been out on dates, and people have seen me with a date, you know. And I'm trying to have a date, you know. Right. And uh, and I've had people come up and invite themselves on the date, like, "Ooh, I'm gonna sit with y'all." And I'm like, um, "Are you? Oh my god! How does that feel? How do you? How do you feel?" Man, that's crossing the line. So that's when I'd be like, "Please don't." And yeah. I smile, and they'd be like, "Oh, okay, okay, okay." And I'm like, "Thank you so much." Wow. Okay. Well, you handle it very nicely. I tell you, <laughs> you handle it very good. Now, you know your documentary, your 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 performance there. A tough. This bitch better be funny. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Many other comedians prior, and has definitely that definitely means something to a lot of people within the neighborhood. What did that feel like? Um, it felt surreal. Like that was I remember, and I still remember standing up on that stage. And thinking, I cannot believe I'm on stage at the Howard Theater. Oh my God! Right. The people who got me in there. Really? And I mean, it was, it was, um, you know, it was. I was. They still didn't really think much of me over there, though, because when people started like talking about me performing there, I was like, oh no, I would never do the Howard Theater. And they started like going to the box office, like, "Are y'all ever gonna have Samson here?" So I was like, "Oh, y'all are crazy!" Because I mean, I could sell out nightclubs, and I could sell out, you know, the DC Art Center or Bus Boys and Poets or whatever. Um, but the Howard is where not only was it a place where people like Drew Hill and R. Kelly and can we say his name? Um, <laughs> not only was it place a place where like Drew Hill and R. Kelly and Brandy and you know. Um, and you know all these mid to big name acts. I mean, they're legends in the black community. Yeah. Were performing, they're selling out shows, and I mean, it it it, it can house up to twelve hundred people, and um, it just wasn't a place. And so, not only that, but it also was home to black history, entertainment history legends right. like 
Moms Mabley and Ella Fitzgerald and Count Basie and Miles Davis and Sarah Vaughn and, you know, and, and Little Richard and Ike and Tina. All of them regularly played before black people, black entertainers were able to perform at venues in front of se- uh, desegregated audiences. Right. Wow. So this wow. is a historical landmark. This is like in the vein of the Apollo. It's in the vein of the Madam C.J. Walker Theater. It's in the vein of the Fox in Detroit, you know, of places the Regal, you know, right. um, you know, places like that. And um, and it was the people who kept saying, well, we want him here. So finally I said, all right. And um, I met with the theater to, to, to do it. And um, she wasn't trying to have me there. And she, at first, it seemed like she was trying to make it as challenging as possible for me to get it. But when I agreed to take it on, um, and I didn't know where I was going to get the money for that theater from. Yeah. Um, I got it. And a couple people stepped in and helped me out. And, and the next thing I know, and I was upset, too, because at first the people weren't, they, you know, they were like, oh, yeah, we want Samson to come. And I'm like, we well, all have to, it's one thing to say it or the lack of status or the lack of page or whatever. It's another thing to show up. And um, and so the tickets went, the show was in August. I think it was August the 27th. 2013 if i'm not mistaken yeah um and uh the tickets went on sale in june so by the first of july we had no by the first of august we had only sold nine tickets oh in the God. big ass theater and you can't oh wow you don't understand living oh I, I, yeah Libid. i can understand that i can understand that you don't understand living so what i did was um I just wasn't taking any chances because I was on the same week. So on Monday, it was Eve. My show was on a Tuesday. So Monday was Eve. Tuesday, it was me. Wednesday and Thursday, it was Anthony Anthony Hamilton. Friday, it was Andrew Stone. And Saturday, it was Salt and Pepper. Okay. And um, and so the lady was like, well, you want me so nine tickets. So I was telling you, you know, you should have just maybe stuck to like a club. Or, and I was like, no. So what I did was, is, is I got on, um, and mind you, I, this, I made all this happen without any type of, you know, media helping me, really. Yeah. Uh, I got online, and I said, you know, this week, uh, I was like, the week that I'm performing, I'm on there with Angie Stone, Anthony Hamilton, Eve Salt and Pepper. And I was like, uh, and I'm selling more tickets than all of them. Really? You So, so you basically had to kind of, Kind of build up, <laughs> so to say. I put it out there. I put it out there. I said I. I didn't say I was. I said I'm selling. Yes. Oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> I said I'm selling as if I'm going to, and I put that online. And people, <laughs> the next thing I know, the very next day, the lady, the the, the theater director, called me. And she said, um, what's going on? And I said, what? She said, because within the last about 18 hours, you've outsold all these people. Wow. And so by the week of the show, I had outsold everybody. That week, my show, and and, and this is Andy Stone, Eve, Anthony Hamilton, Salt Pepper, my show had the highest ticket sales out of all those shows. That Are you serious right now? Yep. Wow. Because when that happened, I don't know. I mean, people took it and ran with it. Because, I mean, I don't know. It was just then all of a sudden, like, the gay press got on it and, and a lot of local press. Like, I mean, I didn't have, like, local radio and local TV. Local press help. Washington Post jumped on it. Like, all these media, like, printed media outlets and wow. blogs started saying, oh, my God, Samson is, you know, Samson is coming and he's the, he's the first LGBT comic to headline the Howard. And I was like, wow. And then when I got there and saw how many, because I mean, I, I thought that I thought I could get a good amount of people out, like a decent amount of people. I didn't know I would nearly sell that place out. Wow. that That's definitely historic. You can definitely put a little feather in your cap on that one. That's for sure. Well, yeah. And you know, when I have, when I have my moments where, because um, I mean, that's the thing is it's not a one-time thing. Like, I mean, doing this is something you always have to, be invested in and so when i'm having my moments when i'm like lord jesus you know why do i keep doing this you know when i'm you know going through it as any professional artist would tell you no matter what stage you are in your career 
you know, you still have to figure things out sometimes. I'm like, God, why, why am I doing this? I think back to that and a couple of other things that I have done. And um, either personally or professionally that let me know I could do anything. Absolutely. You've also been at the White House. You've also yeah. been in Hollywood's famous comedy store. You've also been on Broadway. Yeah. Is that correct? Yes, I've been, uh, well, actually, all Broadway. I've been all Broadway. I've okay. Uh, I, I've done yeah, something. I got invited to the White House for arts and activism. Uh, I was using, you know, and I, it was unbeknownst to me that it was a such thing, mm-hmm. using humor to talk about social issues. And, and so uh, President Obama, his administration, invited me to the White House. He was on the campaign trail, but I do have a picture uh, I got invited to the vice president's house along with at the White House um, to have dinner with him, and uh, wow. and it was beautiful. So I got to do something there, the Kennedy Center for, for the Performing Arts. Um, of course, I was in the uh, I was in the off Broadway production of B Boy Blues, the stage play. I played Barry Daniel uh, from the book, and I've done I've done quite a bit. And and I'm I'm trying to push James Earl Hardy, who is the author of B Boy Blues. If you don't know about B-Boy Blues, I need y'all to catch up. B-Boy Blues was the first love story. Many of us, when we were in middle school or whatever, high school, you know, we had that book hidden under our bed because it was it was the first thing that we really had gotten a hold to that we could understand that told a story similar to anything that we were familiar with. So it was a, it was a great story, and I'm happy I was able to do it. I'm pushing... Uh, James Earl Hardy to do it, the actual movie, and that's been in the work for the last 10, 15 years it needs to happen. Well, you know what? I totally forgot about B-Boy Blues. You're right about that. Now, do all this that you are doing, you wind up lecturing at the Harvard University? I lectured at Harvard University uh, on on uh, race and sexuality. Huh. Um, again, this was back during the whole download era. And really, to tell you something, too, because you mentioned it earlier, so, uh, and man, I love him to death, and now I hated him back then. But um, uh, J.L. King, who wrote the book on the download, I don't know if you remember that. Yes, I remember that. I remember that. Piece of work. Uh, he and I were doing a reality series together at one time moving on with their lives after he came out and you know moved out and so you know how they were finding love again um and how they were moving on and his wife didn't like me for real so some reality tv was scripted <laughs> but um his wife on that show she was throwing daggers at me for real really yes like it was it was it was serious like i walked in and here i am and i was about 23 or something like that and um, maybe, tw- I don't know how old I was. I got to go back and look. But I got pictures of when we were on set doing that show. And um, so I walk in and his wife sees me and she's like, oh, so, so. And because he liked them, you know, young and silly. And I've always been like very young and sophisticated. I was young and sophisticated. Okay. And so I walk up in there and, and I'm like, well, hello, um, Mrs. King. And she says, well, I'm not Mrs. King anymore. I think his action, his action, something or another, made that not a thing. Whatever she said, it was something catty. Yeah. And I was like, well, that's not my fault. <laughs> and she said, well, you're here, so it's your fault. And like, she was really, she was throwing daggers. So, I mean, you know, the, the, there's also a difference that I've also seen that society seems to accept, and it seems not just the way in the music industry, but also in entertainment, they seem to accept lesbians better and no of course well that's because we sexualize women and you know um a lot of it is just the, 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 how they sexualize women they say oh well at least it's two women so i can deal with that um and, and, and a lot of times it's these dudes oh well you gay because you haven't had the right day the reason why the reason why women are lesbians the reason why people become lesbians is because they have negative relationships with men and I said, well, I think because I'm a gay man and I've had a couple fucked relationships with men and that never turned me into a, a lesbian. So what are you trying to say? Right. And um, I don't know. It's just the sexual. Because, I mean, personally, me, I think looking at two men do it is uh, some of the hardest shit you can ever see. Do you, I think there will ever be more black gay male comedians to come out and do what you do. Yeah, it's going to happen. Um, 
it's happening in different capacities already. I mean, you know, some of them, some of them are putting wigs on online or whatever. But I, I mean, they're also um, there. You know, there's some white ones. There's some Asian ones. The thing is, is because I mean, at first, and I'm and I'm just being transparent with you right now. Like I said, when I was doing it, it wasn't a thing. Like when I was doing it, it was serious, not a thing. It was it was special. And then when a couple more started popping up, um, I got I almost had a heart attack. It's not gonna just be one person. I mean, if you look back in history, you know, it took a it took a, a Della Reese and a Lena Horn and an Eartha Kitt and a Dor- Dorothy Dandridge and a Josephine Baker. And a uh, and an Ella Fitzgerald and a Billie Holiday, and all of their contributions, as beautiful as they were, knocked down a huge door in this business, which gave us the Patties and the Arethas, who knocked down the doors to give us the Whitneys and the Mariahs and the Tonys. I just wish they would get back to knowing how to sing again, but that's another thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love but I mean, it's. You know, everybody, everybody contributed in their own way. Right, right. You know, and so, and that's what we need. And ultimately, it's going to take a couple of different styles. And I mean, I realize that, um, you know, my, what I do, I do it so well, nobody else do the way I do it. Right, right, right. But somebody else can come in and they contribute, they can contribute however they need to. And, um, and I believe ultimately that there is enough. For, for more than one of us to make it, you know, um, you know, and when I say make it, I mean make it where we have the commercial exposure and money and opportunities and things like that. Because I mean, if you look at it, when one person is in New York, and that same night you might need somebody else in Miami, you're gonna need two people, and then you might need somebody else in LA, and you might need somebody else in Denver. So, I mean, there is enough, and I think with minorities, particularly black people and people of color, I think we've been conditioned to look at look at each other as, as competition right. and right. to look at each other as, as uh, somebody who, who's going to pre- prevent us from being able to have what we need. And um, and I don't think that that's true anymore. Right. No, you're actually right about that. It's, good. it's kind of funny because I didn't really know how many other black gay comedians there were, period. And so, in one particular article, I believe her name is Tammy P.A. I'm not sure. If yeah, yeah, I know about Tammy. She's a friend. And, and so, when she, I'm not, not sure she said this quote or he said this quote, but when this particular quote, a prize celebration, when it comes to, to book talent, they will find a coked out disco queen right out of rehab <laughs> before they will sign a black LGBT comedian. And I yeah, found absolutely. that. Like I found that pretty strong to hear. Is that true? You can agree with that? It's absolutely. Uh, I remember that interview. It's absolutely right. Um, you know, they it, it's horrible because I mean it's and I get on them all the time. I'm like because they're like, oh, well, nobody wants to see black gay artists, and I'm like, well, bitch, it's because you don't give us a platform. Right. Now, mind you, the work that I see, I uh, and I mean I've had close opportunities. Like I mean. I interviewed for, and they reached out to me, I interviewed for the new reboot of Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. And oh. I was quite convinced that I had the role, um, and I didn't get it, right. you know. Um, and there were a couple of other, um, there were a couple of other opportunities that I was in, you know, fingers uh, reach of that I did not get. Which the fact that they even reach out to me at all lets me know that I do have a platform and I have created work that's gotten somebody's attention. Right. Right. Um, right. So you know when these when these promoters go, oh, well, nobody nobody wants to see y'all this and that. That's a bunch of shit. And if they really used the resources that we had to create a space for us to pay us, um, you know, we could build an audience. I mean, we don't even have our own community backing us up. You know. That you know that that it, that does seem to be, and why is that? And I, and and it's sad, like because I mean I've been, like I said I've been doing this seventeen years, and at my shows, and it used to hurt my, it used to be absolutely just, it used to make me so upset. Uh, 
gay men don't come see me like that. And they know who I am. But uh, the, some of the white queens, I mean, you have a few. I mean, the older ones who are like married and settled down, do. Uh, but in general, gay men have not supported me. So wait, so wait a minute. So is it mostly been black straight people, or I mean, what, what, what has it been? Oh, uh, lesbians. Lesbians have been number one. Lesbians have been coming out for me for years. Wow. Um, and and black women and liberal liberal white liberal white. That is that's so interesting. You know, it's kind of funny you mentioned that because, um, you know, we were trying to develop sometime last year. Uh, Fort Lauderdale is trying to make a pride. Mr. Earl, Earl Folks in D.C., we were on the phone with him, and he called me, and, I, and he, he said, you know what, you know, when, it, when it comes to making a pride, make sure that you reach out to everybody and make sure that includes lesbians. And you will find that lesbians are, lesbians are a lot more loyal and dedicated to you. And I did. I, and I, I, I was amazed to hear that. I didn't. Even, I didn't even thought like that. Because again, and then again, you know, a lot of people. You know, I know. You know, I'd have lesbian friends, etc. But I never knew that loyalty would be like that. With the, they uh, are the most loyal. I mean, they buy all my books. They've had me at a at phase one, and um, and I remember I used to do a show over at. Um, Lace Lounge, and both of those were exclusively lesbian institute. Like they, men were not allowed in there. Wow! And I was, I was the first man at both of these places, headlining these places. So it kind of, it, it kind of turns my mind to a way different, you know, direction when it comes to loyalty and also building that community. Maybe we, you know, the whole aspect of the word community has to be restructured and built. Because I, I definitely have come to that conclusion, especially in some of, some of the meetings over here at Brothers Speaking World Manners. But, you know, I definitely want to, I want to make sure to plug your book, Carefree Black Boy Essays on Life and Redefining Masculinity, your current album, Shea Butter and Jesus. I still love that title. I still love Thank it. you. <laughs> and definitely, and I think everyone should definitely take a look on, especially on YouTube, when it comes to your sta- your, the uh, the legendary performance, I'm going to say legendary, at Howard Theater, uh, when it came down yeah. to your, you know, bitch, you better be funny. As the night went on, that show just got funnier and funnier. Um, you know, when it was... I'm I'm very proud of that show, and we also online we have another show that I did um, in a very intimate space, which is, is is create my best work at actually um, in the BC Art Center. We recorded this show called um, The Shade of It All. It was on YouTube as well, and that show was hilarious. Like, the Shade of that It was All. The, show, okay. the Shade of It All. I had gotten back on a honeymoon with my comedy. Wow. And and that show was 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 some evidence of that. It was it was beautiful. Wow, wow! And is the show still running or it stopped? Uh, that show is still on YouTube. So if you go on and look up uh, the shade of it all, and put my name in that show, and it's a thirty-eight minute show, and I I believe, um, and that was another show. Like the intro for that show, the first five or ten minutes of that show was off the top of my head. Wow, and. Um, and it was incredible. It was it was a show that I'm very proud of. It's on iTunes. So if you go on iTunes, there's Don't Make Me Take Off My Earrings, which is um, a classic. Yeah, I mean, it's, I have some really good work out there that I'm proud of. And I'm going to be creating some stuff that I'm, I feel like will be even better than the stuff that I've done. Well, one thing's for sure. We're going to be looking for a lot more from you. Like you said, 17 years is still a baby's work, but guess what? I'm sure we're going to see a lot more coming from you. And eventually, even though I like Dave Chappelle, he got his Grammy, I'm sure I'm going to see your Grammy sometime later in the future, too. Thank you so much. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Samson. It's really been a lot to me, like I said, to create that diversity on the show, to create, you know, kind of show a lot more people that, hey, we are, we are everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are. I don't even... We create great work, and I and I believe that we are masters because I mean, if you look at the history of everything, if you look at Broadway, if you look at a, uh, you know, film and dance, uh, you know, if you look at gospel, if you look at so many different things, fashion, like we created those things, um, and it, it comes from us, and and I believe that we have to support the people in our community who are actually out. And who are using their talents to not just be great, but also tell our stories. Because when I was little, 
the only thing that I heard about us was that we caught AIDS and we were child molesters and this yeah. and that. And to think that there was some baby who who was around in 2005 and 2006 and seven when Noah's Ark and Noah's Ark the movie was out, and they were able to see themselves, you know, when they were six or seven. Because I mean, wow. when I was six or seven, I knew there was something different about me. I knew I liked boys, but I didn't know how to express it. I didn't know what it was. But I mean, to be that young and to see something on television or in media, let you know you're perfectly okay. I think that that really gets you ready for a future of of a society that tells you you're not okay. And you can tell them, you can kiss my black ass, uh, <laughs> whatever color ass you got. And you're able to own who you are. And I think that's important. It is. It is ter- definitely important. And again, uh, I want people to definitely make sure that they go and buy your book. I'm going to make sure I put that on Instagram. I'm going to make sure I put that on, on Facebook as well. Again, they, even though I know you were in a little little diner over there. like <laughs> yeah, these people are over here going in. It's, yeah, I'm I on the can... West Coast. It's almost 5 o'clock and they in here ordering a crap I'm like, you need to go home and eat dinner and go to bed. <laughs> Well, you know what? Even with, despite all the noise back there, we made it through. And I do appreciate you yes, coming on did. the show. Thank you so much, Samson. And like I said, look out. I'm going to make sure I put all your all your information on there. And make a little small little video clip so you'll see that too. And I'll make sure I tag you in. Please do. And I so appreciate it. And I appreciate what you're doing. Um, because we, we really need all hands on deck to make, you know, to make this work in our community. And, and give our community outlets and things that we can look at and support. Exactly. And you know what? I'm not done. I still got some plans in my head to see if you come down to South Florida. Anyway, <laughs> but I'll let keep me going. know when I'm there, and we will make it work. It ain't nothing but the back. Okay. All right. Now I'm gonna hold you to it. <laughs> all right. Again, thank you so much for coming to the show. This is Christian Brothers Podcast signing off. Really appreciate it. Thank you again. <laughs>